Welcome to the short tutorial. Today we are going to be using neural networks to detect MNIST data set but we are going to see if it can detect actual handwritten digits. So let me try, let me just fire up my webcam and put the 3 in front of my webcam and see if it can actually detect the 3. So okay this is a pretty decent 3 and let's see if we were able to detect this 3. Alright yes we were able to detect this 3 and let's try something else let's try five i have a bunch of these that i've tried with it it's pretty good but let's just try it one more time and load all right let me just place it in front five capture all right that's a pretty decent five i hopefully it should be able to detect five as well all right and it detected five uh, by the way, this is all hosted on Google Colab, so you can just copy the link. It's on GitHub, and of course, it's on uh, my Medium article. So yeah, let's get started on the tutorial. Installing, like loading all the modules first of all. Once you have all the modules loaded, so we have TensorFlow, and TensorFlow is the backend, and Keras is a library which sits on top of TensorFlow, TensorFlow and basically makes a life work. A lot easier <laughs> all right so when we go to tensorboard tensorboard is something that allows us to visualize data um, uh, basically the performance of the model as the model trains itself matplotlib and cv2 is basically allowing us to um, for data visualization but for the data that we are dealing with in the model all right so mnist is one of the basic data sets it's like the hello world of data science and so it comes it's one of the default data sets that's available so we just load it we don't like have need to take it from some different source and the moment we get it we divide the data into two parts test and train so train data is basically the kind of data that the model gets to see and the test is what the model will use to evaluate itself all right so train so we have 60000 data points and that is 60000 images handwritten digits and then each image is a 28 by 28 so basically it is a two-dimensional array it's like a kind of a square 28 rows 28 columns and that's how it is and then each each image which is a 28 by 28 two-dimensional array has a label associated with it for example if you have three three will be in 28 by 28 and it will have a label three along with it similarly we have some test data which is 10,000 data points of the similar kind of um, digits and this is basically just me printing how the data looks like so as you can see with the uh, these brackets so there are two so we can tell it's a two dimensional array and this is how it looks like mm, and similarly these are the labels along with the train so it says the first image that we have is of a five second is of a zero and now let's try to print it here this is what we are using to print so as you can see the first one should be a five all right so this is kind of a five but all right uh next one should be a zero so yeah it kind of looks like zero four one and nine all right so this basically just gives us a feel for basically what are we dealing with and that's kind of very important when you're dealing with images to understand in a tangible sense what are you dealing with normalize so right now this is an image which has got different values uh, this is a black and white image, but we want to normalize it. We want to basically get all the binary values between like 0 to 1. And the reason we do it is, I've by the way explained it more in detail on the Medium article, but the reason we do it is that we want to scale each and every feature to the same scale. So it, and it basically makes the model's job a lot easier and we have more consistency. So we scale the train and test between 0 to 1. And then we just check. So all the white places got zero and places where there was some black, we got zero in different. So basically this is kind of a grayscale thing going on where it gives black a certain value. So we have that going on and then we here is where we build the model. So we say sequential. Sequential is basically putting a bunch of layers one ahead of the other. Uh, it basically means you have a bunch of layers which are just placed in a sequence one after the other. Flatten. Now the reason that we are using flatten here is our input is a 28 by 28 array and what we want to do is and what the model is expecting is just a one dimensional array. So what flatten basically does is instead of us having to resize it into 
something which the model understands flatten basically says all right i have a two dimensional array or an n dimensional array and i'm going to put everything in one column and increase the number of rows so everything which was uh, horizontally becomes vertical and we get a one dimensional array then we add a bunch of layers so, so this is a dense layer with the railway as an activation function not dense dense basically means each neuron is connected to every other input output and uh, in broader terms it just means every new everything is connected to everything in simpler words and relu is an activation function so an activation function basically says when the neuron should fire or not fire uh, and similarly the last layer is a dense layer where we have a softmax softmax is an activation function which is used for probability distribution and then compile so basically now we have a bunch of layers which are kind of separate and compile just brings them on together in a box and says here's the box here you put in the input here you're going to get the output and we have an optimizer and we have different parameters i go into detail in the article but the metrics metrics is basically allowing the model to evaluate or maybe self evaluate itself where it goes like these are the metrics so to understand for you are you doing well or bad fit fit is something that is basically us saying to the model here's the data that you need to train on with the labels and epochs epochs is the number of times that the model gets to see the data so for so if it was one model will just see it one two twice three three times so on and so forth and each time the model looks at the data it learns something new it catches on to some different feature and as you can see with each epoch the loss went down and accuracy went up so in an ideal case in a perfect world we would always want the loss to go down and accuracy to go up but there's a catch to it if there was too many epochs we might overfit the model overfit the model is basically the model gets too too constrained and used to the data that we made it see so anything apart from what it hasn't seen it won't it might not be able to detect it properly so that is where tensor tensor board comes in which allows us to find a point where the loss went down and accuracy went up uh, till a certain number of epochs and after that we saw the performance go down and that or become stagnant so that is basically our cue to say all right these many epochs are optimum now let's move on to the solution so we have fed the data we our model is ready and now we are making prediction on it so each prediction is basically going to be a set of 10 probabilities so at index 0 you will have a probability at index 1 you will have a probability and basically that is a model trying to tell you so you may be input 3 and i detect that it is a 3 by 80% like 80% probability that it is a 3 but it could be 0.01% a 1 and so each class that is 0 1 2 3 will have a probability associated with it and it is called a distributed prob probability distribution because when you combine all of them they all add up to 1 and argmax argmax is a function that allows us to basically just find the maximum probability by index so it says on the seventh position we have the maximum probability so i detect what you showed me was 7 and let's plot in a test data at the zeroth position what was it and it was 7 so that means the model has detected it pretty accurately all right and then this just doing it again um so here is a code where which allows us to access the webcam on our in our browser using google collab and here is me taking a picture of 3 um through the webcam and once i did that So again now this is an image which is in a different size right so first step is and it is a colored image uh, it looks black and white but it's a colored image it has rgb values so step 1 convert it into black and white step 2 um uh so step 2 is read it in a grayscale format using cv2 and now we want to it's on our itself a different size right it has it's black and white but it's a different size so now our aim is to convert it into the same size as our input that the model is used to seeing that is 28 by 28 so we resize it here and we again now have a black and white image which is in 28 by 28 and also don't forget to normalize because we had normalized our input data which the model trained on so 
we can't have values which range from 0 and 1 till 255. We want them between 0 to 1 and that is what we exactly do with this image here. And now we predict on the model. And this is what, uh, th this is the image that we took. This is it being converted into black and white. And this is it being resized into 28 by 28. And now it has given a probability distribution uh, as the output. So it says that it could be a zero with this probability. It could be a one with this probability. So these are pretty low probabilities. As you can see, it is e raised to a minus zero six. So it's pretty confident it's not a one. It's pretty confident it's not a seven. It's not that confident. It says it could be a two. So the probability is not as low as zero and one. The probability of three being the highest is very high. It's zero point nine eight. So it's very almost ninety eight percent sure. It go like yeah, it's three. And for the rest, again, it is pretty low, but it said it could also be a 7, it could be an 8 with some probability. But again, since 3 was the highest probability, we call it a 3. And that is what it was, as you can see. So, uh, so this is the bare-bone breakdown in the video version of it. Uh, if you want a more detailed understanding of why we chose these many layers, what does each term mean, and why which function was used and why uh, please go and check out the medium article i think it is a fair enough description this is like the most basic application of image recognition and getting introduced to deep learning and how to use tensorflow and what the scalars do um, yeah and hopefully i'll be making more of such kind of short tutorials fun tutorials in the future and yeah, please leave a like, comment, and reach out to me if I have made a mistake because even I'm learning and I want to continue learning. And yeah, let's learn together and thank you for watching.